collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up this week, we talk about negative interest at the banks. Should you be paying them to use your money? The principle is that the customer deposits the money in the bank and the bank has the right to use the money. And that is from where the banks make their own living because the difference between the interest rates that they pay to depositors and the interest rate that they get from the borrowers. That is meant to be traditionally the income from the banks. And a virologist brings us up to speed on coronavirus. The dry cough, the sore throat and the shortness of breath if things are allowed to advance are the most common ones. There's no runny nose and no diarrhea which might be associated with other colds and flu. On the 1st of March, corporations in Cyprus started paying negative interest at our banks. There's thoughts ahead that possibly this might affect individuals as well, but not for the moment. What is negative interest rate? Is it a good idea, economically speaking? Well, I'm no expert, but we're joined by someone who is on this week's programme. He is Marios Christou, who is from the Economics and Finance Department of the University of Nicosia. So, can you explain first what negative interest is? and why the banks are doing this. The negative interest rate is when uh, the banks charge their customers instead of paying their customers for the money that uh, they deposit in the bank. Doesn't that turn banking, as it was traditionally known, on its head? The idea was that if you saved, you got interest, and the banks used your money for whatever they needed to use it for. Now they're asking you to pay them so that they can use your money. Yes, still the, the, the banks use the money. So the principle is that the customer deposits the money in the bank and the bank has the right to use the money. And that is from where the banks make their own living because the difference between the interest rates that they pay to depositors and the interest rate that they get from the borrowers, that is meant to be traditionally the income for the banks. So, for example, the banks could give a 2% interest rate to the saver to the depositor and charge a 4% interest rate to the borrower. So that 2% difference is the income of the the banks. So now what happens is that the banks, first of all, have uh, what we call it excess liquidity, which means that there are a lot of money deposited in the banks, which the banks cannot use because they don't have the opportunity to lend them. So this is not good for the banks. Now, is it that they don't have the opportunity to lend them, or here in Cyprus is this a little bit of a fallout from the NPLs and the fact that they're being much more careful who they lend to? Right. The opportunity means that they don't have the chance hmm, to, to lend them out. Now, this is because the economy is highly leveraged, both the public sector and the private sector. When we say the public sector is the government sector, but we put aside this, and then we have the private sector. So business and individuals have very high debts. Therefore, they cannot borrow unless, first of all, they pay for their debts. So this is a problem. So in a highly leveraged economy like this, there are no opportunities for the banks to lend the money. Therefore, the banks are parked in bank accounts. So this is not profitable for the banks. Is my understanding correct that the banks are also paying negative interest to the European Central Bank? And this has got a lot to do with the years of quantitative easing. Can you explain how that plays into the whole scenario? Yes, because uh, the banks have to to maintain their own deposits with the European Central Bank, with the euro system. So the European Central Banks, because the inflation rate in the euro area is low, the target for the European Central Bank is to uh, maintain a monetary policy which uh, will help inflation to be close but less than 2%. 
Now, inflation is too low in the euro area, which means uh, that, okay, some people might say, okay, prices are not going up. So this is good, but it's not quite such because we need to have a moderate level of inflation, which means economic growth. Therefore, without a moderate small level of inflation, there is no economic growth. Therefore, the European Central Bank encourages banks and, of course, financial institutions in general, but mainly banks, to provide loans, to provide liquidity in the economy, and therefore people can take this liquidity and either spend it for consumption purposes or invest it. And therefore, we achieve economic growth. Therefore, to encourage this, the European Central Bank charges negative interest rates for banks that do have funds, deposits, parked in their uh, accounts and not used. Therefore, the banks in Cyprus find themselves in a very difficult position, which is to accept deposits from people but not being able to use them and at the same time to have to pay to the European Central Bank for the cost of maintaining these deposits in their, in their balance sheets. Forgive me, but it sounds a bit like the system's broken. Okay, um, somebody might say, yes, the system is broken. Uh, somebody might argue that, um, yes, it's, uh, it's a policy that aims to encouraging banks to uh, lend money. But here in Cyprus, uh, as I've said, and it's not in Cyprus only, it's uh, almost everywhere in, in, in Europe that the economies are highly leveraged. So it's not only in Cyprus that banks cannot easily give loans, but uh, it happens in other parts of of Europe as well. Fair enough, but doesn't this mean that the whole move is counterproductive? It's not achieving what it sets out to achieve, and is there an alternative? Yes, that's true. That's true, that uh, the system is, to some extent, counterproductive in the sense that, okay, we have the system because we want to encourage banks to give loans, but then where to give the loans? Uh, So there's a stalemate there, so uh, the, the, the system is somehow blocked at some stage. Um, Can you unblock it? How could it be unblocked? Because um, you've also got to look at the rather sick state of some of the European currencies. Um, Italy for years now has been on the brink of, I think, a serious financial crisis that could actually, could it bring down the euro completely? I'm not sure if this can bring down the euro completely, but uh, definitely that might create problems to the currency as we had the problem with Greece. Because, you see, um, for a monetary union to operate, as we have now in in the euro area, uh, you need to have uh, stability. But you also surely need to have a standard economic or fiscal policy. And a lot of people have said over the years that without some sort of central policy across the block, with each country doing its own thing, it can't work. Yes, but there are some parameters that um, provide for that. For example, the budget deficit of every state shouldn't be more than 3% of the GDP. So that is what was... uh, That's the Maastricht criteria, is it? The Maastricht criteria is is, is, is put there for two reasons. A, to become a member of the euro area and B, to maintain stability. So that's the stability pact. But there are countries that exceed the Maastricht criteria. Exactly. Um, And the first that broke that were Germany and and, and, and France. And then the others followed in, um, uh, I would say, a more severe way. And that's where the problem was created. For example, the problem with Greece. So what we need to have in Europe is a very, very strict policy and probably a regulation or a, leg- a regulatory authority that uh, blocks any any countries which uh, move out of these uh, of the provisions of the of the stability pact. What do you mean by block the countries? Because probably, again, probably. you're talking about the idea that within the union, each country has control over its own policies and yes, fiscal policies. Yes, the monetary policy is no, the fiscal from policies. The, yes. So. How would you block a country? Well, what, what, what would you do? If their, budget, if their budget exceeds, for example, the 3% uh, target, then uh, any financial assistance that is coming from uh, community funds uh, should be blocked. 
So, but that surely the, would make the situation worse for that country. Well, it depends on which country do we talk about and uh, at which stage, uh, economic stage or condition the, 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 the countries. For example, if Cyprus, let's say, now that is in uh, the recovery process and um, who is doing very well with uh, its um, fiscal policy and uh, the surpluses, also Greece is doing very well. If they start deviating from the targets, then to be to be blocked, so they cannot do, they cannot live without the community money, the community support. So there has to be a mechanism through which the the community imposes more strict measures on member states whose fiscal policy deviates from the from the target, from the indicators of the stability pact. But we don't have that at the moment. We are meant to have it. That's why I'm saying that we have to be strict. So it has to be implemented somehow. So what what we have is yes, the stability pact provides so and so and so. But the question is, how do you implement in a very strict way to member states the stability pact? And you're talking about literally cutting off EU funding for them. Probably yes. But or surely, parts of EU funding. Surely that would mean that then they wouldn't be able to maintain, for example the growth in the areas where they get the funding. So you're back, in a sense, to a chicken and egg thing as to how you break that cycle. Yes, but uh, you see, if you don't uh, put restrictions and if you don't follow a moderate policy uh, and strict policy, then uh, the one brings the other. So if you allow countries to overspend, then the situation will get worse. So they have to... Uh, so they want people to spend, but they only want them to spend a certain amount. For Yes, for exercising their, their, their fiscal policy. Because we know that the budgets go to the European Union, they are there and the European Union sees the budgets, the monetary authorities uh, see the budgets. So I don't think that uh, member states are they are just uh, free to do what, whatever they want. There are some mechanisms that follow what is happening, but there must be more, let's say, policies, restrictive policies, that will not allow the countries to exceed the fiscal targets that they have. Let's come back to the situation in Cyprus and this business from the 1st of March that businesses here are going to be paying the negative interest. Presumably it's the very big businesses that are going to be affected most. How do you think, though, it will impact the SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises, which are the backbone of the Cyprus economy? Okay. Well, um, first of all, uh, most of the SMEs are in a high in a high leverage state, so they they rather owe money than they can uh, save money. So the question is not whether there are funds deposited in the banks, but whether they can borrow to to expand with those funds with uh, with borrowing. So that's question number one. the The answer is that uh, those that will have excess deposits or money in, in the banks, most probably they will seek to take them out of Cyprus. That is the most uh, probable scenario, I would say. And outside Cyprus, you mean outside the EU? Um, because this is going to be yes an EU-wide no. policy, isn't it? Yes, yes and no. Because um, there might be, for example, um, individuals, I know individuals now, that they invest in property in Greece. So there are alternative markets where they can take their money and deposit and deposit their money. What about the individual uh, citizen? Because at the moment, as we said at the beginning, I don't think they're covered by this, but there has been a thought that they might be in the future. And, of course, there's also the current situation with bank charges, and I think we're expecting a move maybe from the central bank to try and minimise those because the thought is encouraging people to bank digitally but with a fairly aged population, particularly in the rural areas here and bank branches closing, that is making life very difficult, isn't it, for the average elderly citizen of, of the island? Yes, I, I, I totally agree with you for the, I would say, the financial digital illiteracy of uh, a large part of the population. 
and this is where the problem is, I believe, plus, of course, the fact that these people, the older people, who have their savings to use them for the rest of their lives are not those who will uh, take their savings abroad and either invest them in property or deposit them in, in other banks. It's their nest egg for their old age, isn't it? Yes. So How is that going to be affected? At the moment, not, but it could At the be. moment, not, but it could be, yes, it could be. Still, now it's affected anyway because people who go to the teller to uh, withdraw money are charged. So if you go to ask for withdrawing 500 euros from your bank account, they will charge you with two or five euros, whatever is a policy of the banks. While if, uh, let's say, you go to the ATM and you withdraw your money, you pay nothing for that. So that is uh, something that uh, already affects people, but we still see long queues in front of the tellers. Uh, because people don't know any other way. Because, yes, and they are used to that. So it's very, very difficult to do it. But even this is the situation with young people. If you go down the road here where there are students, and students are young people doing very well with uh, technology and uh, digital literacy, still you, you see them queuing up in uh, front of tellers to do their, uh, their transaction instead of uh, using the machines. A very quick final question that's just sprung to mind. How far do you think the whole thing and the market will be influenced by a lot of these financial apps that don't charge you for transferring money one place to another and so on and so forth? I've heard people shouting their praises. Again, it's not going to help the people who don't know how to use technology, but are they a threat to the current banking system? They are not a threat to the current banking system as such because we have to make a distinction between what is a bank and what is a payment system. So most of these apps are payment systems, they are not banks. So it's not a wise idea to save your money with one of those systems because the central bank is not covering them as a lender of last resort in the case that something happens with them. So if one of those let's say, payment systems, companies, goes bankrupt, then they are not insured the way that the money are insured with the bank. So So it's a risky business, even though it's probably free transactions at the moment. And people don't know what is the difference between the payment system and the banking system. So the banks offer a bank service and the banking system, and they are covered by the insurance that provides the central bank, while the other systems, which are just payment systems, they are not covered by any type of insurance that is provided by the central banks as being the lenders of last resort. Our thanks to Marios Christou from the University of Nicosia for enlightening us on negative interest rates. The other big topic at the moment, of course, is the coronavirus. And I'm pleased to say we're joined by an expert this week. He is virologist Peter Garianis. Peter, first of all, we don't want people to panic, but they seem to be. And I can't quite understand why. (laughs) I know this isn't exactly like the flu, but it hasn't killed nearly as many people as the flu does every year. Mm -hmm. So why this global panic? Okay, yes, the problem here is that we're dealing with a new infection. There is no immunity in the community, so theoretically it can spread very rapidly and send many, many people to hospital, and then the health authorities will not be able to cope. Uh, Because of this, people are panicking because the media, of course, stress the fact that the virus has killed quite a number of people people so far infected. I think the current count is over 4,000 in various countries around the world, the majority of them in China. But Italy at the moment seems to uh, bear the brunt of the deaths, with about 5% of those infected actually dying, as opposed to 3.5% in China. So for some reason the Italians are not doing very well, possibly because the system is overwhelmed or because they've got no experience in how to handle the uh, most difficult cases. Right, let's talk about what's happening in Cyprus, because Mm. almost every day we seem to have a new, in a sense, directive. The latest one 
seems a bit arbitrary. Mm. No more than 75 people in one place. Now, where does that magic number 75 yes. come from? I'm on from? my way to the ministry now, <laughs> where they were going to try and explain to us how they derived that. I, it's does it make based sense? on the population. Well, uh, to us, it doesn't make sense at the moment, but I'm sure you base, they've based it on some... Uh, module of some sort, which is used to sort of um, ma mathematical module, which is used to uh, try and work out the probability of being infected. So let's talk about what people should be doing. We've all heard all this wash your hands yes. with soap for as long as it takes to sing happy birthday and yes, so on yes. and so forth. Make sure you wash in between exactly. the fingers, backs of the hand and so on and so yes. forth. So do you really need hand sanitizers if you're doing that sort of hygiene no, in every of, time yes. you eat, go to the toilet or perhaps touch a lot of different hard surfaces? Um, it, it's an added uh, safety sort of barrier, if you like, um, which um, will inactivate uh, definitely the virus if it's there. Because the virus has got lipid on its outside envelope, or its covering, to say it in simple, simple terms, which is made up of lipid. And therefore, Otherwise known as oil sort of thing, isn't it? So, type yeah, of thing, yes, so that it yes. can get in where so, it wants to go. Soap, as well as something that dissolves lipids like alcohol, the other two is ether and chloroform, which of course they are very flammable and we cannot use them. We have to resort to using an alcohol-based sanitizer. Break out the zivania. And zivania, in addition, is equally good. Uh, or spirit, which uh, some old households may still have around, it will prove very useful. Because as I've well, just you can heard, buy surgical spirit anyway, yes, can't you? Exactly. As I've heard on the way here, there's four new cases. So we are six in total now. So, and are they in Limassol and Nicosia, or yes. has it spread elsewhere? Uh, in Limassol and Nicosia, I didn't hear the details, but uh, four new cases. Now, it does seem that children mm -hmm. are not picking this up in the same numbers as adults. How do you explain that? It's not that they're not picking it up. Or they it's not been, affecting it's them. A not, yes, they, the symptomatology is much, much milder to the extent that in some children it may be asymptomatic. And that's where the danger lies because they may be infected, not know it, and then spread it around, hence the closure of the schools. What else can we expect to be happening in the next, what, couple I, of months? How long is this going to go on for? I hope that the warming up of the weather in Cyprus will restrict it because it will um, prevent people from congregating indoors. It will um, allow the aeration of the houses much more effectively. And uh, as it happens with many uh, respiratory infections, uh, during the summer they wane because the weather changes. We hope the same will happen with this one. Now, I did read somewhere, but who knows whether it's true or not, that high temperatures can kill this virus. So they say wash with hot, hot water. water yes. Well, if that's the case, surely our body temperature is higher than the temperature which supposedly kills it. Well, I mean, hot water is much, much higher than 37 degrees. Um, Do we know at what temperature the virus usually is Usually 65 degrees. We, we use 65 degrees to denature proteins. So at that temperature, uh, the same thing might happen here, in which case it will prevent the virus from attaching to the receptor. Uh, hot drinks uh, will be beneficial. Uh, our body, I mean, one of the reactions of the body is to raise our temperature to fight the infection. When we run a fever, that's the first line of defense for the body. But then, of course, we use antipyretics to drop our temperature. So we're not really making much favours to ourselves. So should we be drinking a few more cups of tea or coffee a day, hot drinks in the morning, it middle of the day? It will relieve the symptoms. It will relieve the symptoms. It, will, it may prevent the spread of the virus, but the infection will need to run its course. And what about this whole thing? I mean, we've just, uh, my email inbox is absolutely chock a block with people cancelling just about everything. Mm. And again, I can't really understand why. Mm. Surely, if I, you get together with half a dozen people or a couple of dozen people, as long as nobody's sneezing over you, mm -hmm. it's fine, isn't mm. it? Um, that's correct. 
at the moment we don't seem to have a large number of cases, although it seems that we're going that way, um, which doesn't warrant the sort of measures, the draconian measures that are taken. But if we want to avoid what happened to Italy, we might as well take them now than later. Better be safe than sorry. Right, so your advice to people then over the coming couple of weeks? Avoid people with symptoms, wash your hands often, um, don't sort of get too close to people who may have symptoms. A safe radius is around two meters away from them if you come across any of them. And of course the advice to those who have symptoms, although they may not be those of coronavirus, is stay at home, don't spread it around so that... If we have a coronavirus outbreak, then we know who to target immediately. And who to test. Now, tell us a little bit about these tests we keep hearing about, because the other thing is, I've heard from people who've been travelling through European airports or whatever, and they say nobody checked anything. So how seriously can we take these measures if it's not happening everywhere? Um, The reason the temperature is not taken everywhere is because not all symptomatic people will develop a temperature. The dry cough, the sore throat and the shortness of breath, if things are allowed to advance, are the most common ones. There's no runny nose and no diarrhea which might be associated with other colds and flu. So this is what sets it slightly apart from other upper respiratory tract infections. The absence of a runny nose at the beginning. So the tests uh, are genetic tests which cannot be offered to everybody and therefore they're targeted towards suspected cases for confirmatory purposes. And then once somebody has been diagnosed, what's the protocol? Do we have the isolation hospital beds and how long can they expect to be in isolation and treated with what? Okay, the... um, the symptoms in the majority of patients, which is around 85%, are very mild. A, a flu-like or cold-like symptoms, which does not warrant the hospitalization. They can stay at home. Um, and they are they kept an eye on them uh, on a daily basis, more or less, uh, by uh, healthcare professionals. And that's over the telephone? Over the telephone, uh, The other 15% that might require hospitalization, they have to be uh, hospitalized in special wards, and only the 5% which will require support by oxygen or intubation, uh, they need to be put into isolation wards because they are the most sick and um, likely to be replicating the virus at higher levels. Okay, so it's not necessarily that they're going to be getting very, very sick. It's the the fact that the virus has found a host it likes. Yes, and and therefore they are the the most vulnerable. And if they belong to a group that has got chronic problems, health problems, they are the ones that need the most attention. And those health problems are, we've heard about diabetes, for example. Cardiovascular problems respiratory problems, COPD, asthma, uh, and other chronic respiratory infections, Uh, cancer patients, patients who are immunosuppressed following transplantation, and so on. We don't have, fortunately, I think, too many of most of those categories in Cyprus. And I guess the fact that we are an island Mm -hmm. is probably something in our favour, is it? It is, in a way, because we are isolated from everybody else. We stand a very good chance of containing these infections, although I'm a bit worried now, having heard that we've got four new ones. With regards to treating patients who are hospitalised, at the moment it's just pure support, treating the symptoms. We don't have any antiviral agents or any drugs that can be used specifically for the virus. And before you go, let me just ask you about these almost panic moves to try and find a vaccine, because my understanding is with the other flu vaccines, they're only okay for certain types of flu anyway. So each year you may have a flu vaccine, Mm -hmm. but it'll only protect you from one particular type of flu. Yes. With this one, so far, there's only one serotype. In other words, one type. It hasn't changed yet into a different one. And it's not likely to.
You don't think it's going to I, mutate? I because think... we've been reading it that can, they, medical people yes. are saying, yes, the chances they, are it'll mutate. They can mutate, but hopefully not for the worse. <laughs> I'm leaving you on an optimistic note. <laughs> well, that's a good thing to do during this time of relative panic. And that is virologist Peter Garayanis talking to us about coronavirus. I think he might agree with me if I say, keep calm, carry on and wash your hands. Exactly. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.